is a basic human right and that the next billion users will not join the Web3 revolution until we make sure their privacy is as secure, if not better, than the Web2 protocols. Then you came to the place. Sorry for the mic. Today, we'll hear it directly from the experts themselves, the latest news, the people who dedicated much of their work to advance privacy technology. Guy Ziskin, CEO of Secret Labs, founder of Secret Network, Rand Hindi, CEO of Zap, will both, will each share their vision for privacy on the blockchain. Later on, the highlight of this event will have a panel. Pascal Pallier, CTO and co-founder of Zama, one of the leading researchers in homomorphic encryption, and Itzik Grossman, VP of Engineering at Secret Labs. Feel free to stick around. We'll have more time for more networking and more private discussions. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to invite Guy Ziskin. Hi everyone, um, Shachar introduced me, so I'll skip that part. Um, so, uh, first of all, if you're here in this, in this market, I would make an assumption that you care about crypto and you're here to stay and that you're not frightened by anything else that's going on. So I think now is like the time to ask the question, um, what's preventing crypto to really meet like critical mass adoption. And I think um, I talked to like one of the Bitcoin core developer yesterday, which I've known for a while, and we're kind of like reminiscing. And we both kind of said the same thing, which is we couldn't predict that crypto would be known almost a decade later, but at the same time, it's not really mainstream yet. So the question is what, what's, what's preventing it from going mainstream? And if you're here, you probably have enough knowledge to understand that this is not surprising. There's scalability, and that is the thing that pretty much everyone is looking at. And I think that it's fair to say that um, uh, while scalability was an open issue for a long time, it's now no, no longer really a theoretical question. It seems more of an implementation engineering question. And probably somewhere between uh, roll-ups, that the solution will come in the next like years. Uh, but to me, that leaves privacy. So we've been talking about privacy as like the next big thing for a long time. But we think it's like MEV, se true censorship resistance, and really just like thinking ahead, like what could be use cases for this whole Web3, web three, you know, move. But when you kind of have like one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, you start to hear things like, I don't care about my privacy, that's just for criminals, I'm not a criminal, I'm not into hide, like, you know, I'm an open book. Um, that is, in fact, not true, because we all really care about our privacy, and when I kind of go down with people and ask them, like, hey, can I see your credit card? Hey, do, do you want to show me, like, your bank account statement? Then all of a sudden, their, their answers change. But I'm not here to convince you why privacy is important. I'm actually here to convince you that privacy is just this kind of property that you need in the system. And if Web3 is to really become, like it means to just the next iteration of the web, you just cannot have a system like that without 
privacy inherently built in. <coughs> and there are infinite number of examples of that. Um, simplest example maybe is a, a game of poker. Now, I, I'm really bad at poker, I hate poker. So for me it's not the best example, but it still illustrates the point. And the point is that you cannot have a game of poker without privacy. If I see Shaka's card, or Fadiye's card, and he sees my card, there's no game. And if you think about that, you start to kind of go over all of the childhood games that you played, all the grown-up games that you played, all of the online games that you played that are like PvP and all that, without privacy, they just can't work. And if you now go from <coughs> one vertical to the other, you will see that on every vertical, there are so many use cases that you just cannot do without privacy. Um, you know, when it comes to voting, it's ridiculous, right? Like we all expect, most of us, hopefully all of us are living in democracies. Um, we expect voting to be private. But suddenly on the blockchain without, it's okay to have like public voting. And hold and behold, most of those DAOs are like votes are a sham. Even when we propose um, a vote on chain and it's public, we get like 95% plus approval rate. That's how dictatorship works. That's not how democracy is. So, again. Um, um, and there are more and more and more examples like that. I won't bore you, but the fact is that if you go from one example to the other, you would figure out that you need privacy. And I've been saying this and doing this for a long time. So I've been in this space for almost a decade. Um, which sometimes is a good thing and sometimes is a bad thing. Um, but surprisingly so, back in our 2014, 2015, we kind of came out saying, like people were starting to talk about Zcash, uh, Vitalik was kind of coming out with this idea of smart contracts, not just Vitalik, other people, but uh, today it's kind of attributed to Vitalik and Ethereum. Um, and people are kind of coming from the place where it's not just Bitcoin, there's more. They didn't call it Web3, but they say there's more to do this. It's like trusted computing layer that's being built and we can do more with that. <laughs> but we made a, a, a very simple but crazy assertion, which is like, how can this be a trusted computer res computing resource if there is no privacy? And we put a very simple paper on that. It's like really, it's not clever, it's not brilliant, but it became one of the most cited papers <coughs> in the blockchain space. Because obviously today, back then it wasn't clear to people, but today it's clear that you need that. And you need something stronger than just being able to transfer money privately from one person to the other. You need the ability to compute over information in a private way. And I spent my, uh, my master's thesis basically proposing like the FEL system. It was uh, really bad, very slow. It used MPC. How many people do you know what MPC is for her? Okay, great, thanks. I mean, it's so it is MPC, um, and uh, uh, it was great as a research project. It was completely not production ready. And then we went through the hard part, which is how do we take like this cool idea and actually be like a blockchain <coughs> with private compute, with private smart contracts. And it took us, I'd say, about four years to get from theory to practice. And we made some, let's say, pragmatic assumptions in the way. We'll talk about that. Um, but we did it. And CFS Network is today the only private contract blockchain. It's a level one in existence. Um, there has been a slew of applications in Colonia. There's uh, over 60,000 contracts, millions of private computations, there are many more regular transactions, but million private computations plus, uh, and in those private computations, billions and billions of dollars and assets in all kinds of use cases have been held as tender. Um, now, um, how does it work? Well, this is one place where the assumptions <coughs> come in, and I think it ties very well to the conversation today. So, um, um, back a few years ago, a, my realization was that MPC is not going to scale, at least not in its current form, to a full-fledged uh, blockchain. And it's out of scope. If you want to hear the full story, if you're interested in why 
or where I think the problems are, then talk to me and, and have to talk about it. But we went with the, with the, with the direction of essentially um, uh, ensuring that every node in the network runs all computations inside of a tropical distribution environment, again, show of hands, um, who knows what it is? Okay, by the way, so it is essentially a black box that kind of simulates computer over encrypted data, but the assumption is in the hardware. So uh, how many people know what the hardware wallet is? Okay, I just let me know. A T is the hardware wallet. The hardware wallet is essentially a, a one purpose T. You have the private key inside and it, and it can do one computation. That computation is you know, producing signatures over that private key. And the assumption is that even if you hold the device, you can't actually extract the private key. And with that trust model, uh, you, can, you can think about general purpose keys that can actually <coughs> hold any kind of private data and can run any kind of computation. And this is basically the main idea behind Cypress Network. Every validator, every node, essentially runs the computations inside of the key. And when they do it that way, and assuming the key cannot be broken, and that's an assumption we can talk about, but assuming that case, then privacy is preserved and it's essentially seamless computing over encrypted data. And that's how secret works today. Um, there's been a lot of cool things built on our network, um, countless of them. One of the projects that I like the most is the one we did with uh, 2017 or last year. And I'm actually not going to focus on finance. There's a lot of financial applications, but those are kind of trivial. I kind of want to open your eyes to applications that are kind of exceeding beyond just the DeFi financial realm and all that. So when we talked to Quentin, he was immediately very skeptical of NFT. He was like, this is bullshit. And the reason he said this is bullshit was because he said, I'm an artist. When I uh, produce art, when I sell art, there's a meaning, there's a value. But if everyone can copy that, which is the case with NFTs, and by the way, he didn't know much about NFTs, but he did know that everyone can see the NFTs <coughs> and copy them because they're like, on the blockchain and it's public and all that. And he said, that's like a no-go. And obviously that was like a match made in heaven. We told him, look, we have a technology that allows you to keep uh, like encrypted data on the blockchain and then kind of manipulate it in any way that you want and we can do much more interesting things. And that's when he came with the idea and said, look, I have the original Pulp, uh, pulp uh, Fiction screenplay. Uh, it's never been seen before, it's handwritten. The only person who saw it was the typist when she typed the final manuscript, which then that's the thing that everyone sees. But like all of the like the small secrets, all the nuggets, all like the the, the 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 artist in me that went into the original manuscript, no one has seen that. And I want to turn that into an NFT, and I want to make sure that we can encrypt it in a way that only the buyer can then get that NFT, see that NFT, and then decide what what they want to do. It. But it's a one-on-one -on -one transaction. And I want to do something that I, I've never done today. I'm going to uh, show you just an excerpt. I cannot show the full thing, but just an excerpt of what, 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 what that was, a very short one, but so that you get a feeling of what was the content in them. Hopefully it's late. Hello, this is Quentin Tarantino, and I am talking to the purchaser of the NFT of my original handwritten manuscript from Pulp Fiction. This is the last scene in the film. So obviously this is a teaser, but like the page that you saw, high res, like the, the, the whole chapter, each chapter from the screenplay was an NFT, each one has a voiceover, this is just like the best five seconds, but it was a few minutes where it's kind of like going into the tidbits of the creation of that scene, and all of this was like unique content, but it was private content, like those NFTs exist today on Secret Network, and you cannot like actually get them unless you buy them. I think the, we ended up only producing one of those. The reason is legal. Don't like the, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, don't whenever there's an IP dispute between like very big giant and players, don't go in there. That's my recommendation. But the point is that the the, the entities exist on the blockchain. One of them was sold, and that one I think is. I think they put it up for like $10 million. No one's buying it in this market, but uh, that's the situation right now. Um, another cool thing that I want to show. So um, 
you know, there's ENS domains, which is really cool. And, and in general, DNS is kind of broken. It's really not private. There's been a lot of efforts of changing that. So ENS domains and Web3 domains, they are a really refreshing cool idea, but they're really much worse in some ways because they link your identity, a really, really easy to read identity with like your financial history. It seems really bad to me. So DIVs are trying to fix that. And New Web3 services have solved the ownership issue of legacy DNS systems, but they operate on public blockchains. This means anyone can look up the address that owns a domain name and see every transaction that address has ever made. Dibs operates on a privacy blockchain called Secret Network, which chooses privacy by default. You have full control of which info you want to share or don't want to share, allowing complete privacy. Simply put, Dibs approves upon the idea of blockchain domains by bringing complete ownership, security, and privacy to traditional DNS services, allowing true... The last one I kind of want to show you is Alter. Alter is doing this kind of decentralized, trustless, um, it's, it's kind of like all in one, like messaging, like peer-to-peer -peer messaging, peer-to-peer -peer payment, and, um, and uh, like uh, data sharing, like uh, uh, file storage and data sharing like Dropbox, but all of them utilizing the capabilities of secret and kind of making sure that all of these different pieces are not linked to you and they don't get that information, not even messaging that. Um, Welcome to the Alter Network. This platform is designed to give you freedom of speech, to be able to share anything privately. The Alter Network protects your identity. Here, you remain fully anonymous. Alter Network is a place where data collectors and data centers are powerless. Alter is a decentralized communication platform that cannot be stopped. The network is owned by people just like you and me. Alter does not control messages and files that are distributed across the platform. Alter is simply the user interface that enables our users to communicate with one another in a trustless, decentralized manner. Alter Network is a firm believer in the saying, not your keys, not your data. And really there's, uh, again, hopefully the community is either just like a capital extension or the vibrant ecosystem of the others. And many of those use cases you just cannot do in a regular blockchain. So hopefully this convinces you why privacy is important. And just to shed some light, uh, uh, just to shed some light, like here's like a snippet of like the, this is, this is really cool, this is community organized. So this is not us, right? Like we, we're a secret lab, we're the core team behind like the network, but the community, uh, with some help from us, uh, thank you, Jonathan, um, it has basically curated like a roadmap that kind of shows photo by photo what's being released. A lot more things are being worked, and not released like on a quarterly basis, but here's just a snippet of like those two slides show just like in the next three months the things that we expect to go live on our network. Some of these have been in, in work for like a year plus. Um, but we're in this very, I'd say, tech heavy week in Israel, which is really cool in my opinion. A lot of ZK, this is the polyhomomorphic event, so I, I would be remiss if I don't like touch that. And this is actually to me was just like a primer. This to me is like the next frontier. <coughs> us as a company, us as where we think we should go next. To us, uh, uh, the next frontier is really in cryptography. And um, uh, after that, we'll have the, the cryptography expert talk into much more details, but I do want to give kind of like a high level reasoning introduction. So, um, uh, Secret Network does use T's right now, end to end, and T's were, well, <coughs> still are a very pragmatic solution. Uh, I think two things to us are evident. They will be part of any end game solution, but they will probably need to be one of the pieces, not the entire thing. Um, but for many use cases, they, they can be <coughs> the entire thing. It kind of depends on the use case and the level of privacy that you need. So uh, it, it's fairly <coughs> certain that these will continue to be the most cost effective solution, but the question that we've been asking ourselves and why, and the motivation why we believe that it's time to expand beyond just these 
is this question. And the question is like, would you keep an encrypted private key in a smart contract, which you can do in secret today, that controls a million dollars? Like, would you do that? Would you make that highly possible? And I think the answer is honestly is no. Like, that's not what it is great for many things, but this is probably too much, and we need something stronger. Um, so the other obvious, let's say, next thing that people would say is, hey, why don't you use ZK? And I love ZK. ZK are great. We use them. I've used them in research. I do use them right now in practice. They're extremely powerful. But uh, while they do seem to be the end game solution for scaling, when it comes to privacy, um, they they only apply in specific cases, just because of the, uh, zero knowledge uh, proofs work. Specifically, they cannot solve problems that involve multiple users and combining data for multiple users. That is, that is, like, say, the weakness when it comes to privacy. And if you want kind of like a, a maybe rhetorical, maybe trick question to ask yourself, like, and convince yourself why that is true, then there's a very simple question. Like, how do you do a sealed bid auction with just your knowledge? And this is a trick question. I actually asked that question to several people, some of them very deep in the ZK space, and I was surprised to hear that they were trying to kind of uh, uh, find a way around an answer, but there is no answer. Zero knowledge is not built for that. Right? It's, built as, it, it, it's part of the stack, but it's not the whole thing. And so, just like in blockchain, we needed like multiple billion drops to get something like a blockchain, um, also, when you want to move to an encrypted blockchain, privacy preserving blockchain, you need multiple billion blocks. You need different kind of tools that are coming together in a non trivial way. And I think, especially for this talk, I would say that the key ingredient is probably fully amount of encryption. All of the others uh, play, play a piece and, and, and play a part. But eventually, fully amount of encryption is a beautiful idea very complicated uh, uh, to actually get it done and get it done right, very easy to understand. Unlike the trusted execution environment, where it's like a black box that kind of simulates computer over the data, fully on mobile encryption just like that. You just compute over encrypted data directly and call it data. Very easy to understand. Um, and it's kind of crazy that um, 10 years plus years ago, this was impossible. Uh, seven, five to seven years ago, when I was looking at MPC on the blockchain, that was like the golden age of like MPC, because people were saying, look, put on for encryption is never gonna, it's, it's never gonna cut, it's never gonna be efficient enough, yeah, you gotta use MPC. And actually, I, I kind of feel that the tide has changed, and it's moving towards put on for encryption for good reason. Um, there's still lots of moving pieces to solve there, but um, you know, if I were to predict, then I would say that uh, when zero knowledge were, let's say, 2015 to 2017, fully homomorphic is going to extend MPC and private compute in general. I think that's going to be the leading narrative uh, in the next like two to five years in blockchain. Um, and that is, that is clearly what we want to be in the real time to be. Now, I do want to touch a, a minute technical point, but I do think it is important for understanding, especially for this crowd. So uh, when you think of encryption, there's a key, right? There's a key to, to encrypt, and there's a public key to encrypt, which is a, a public uh, a key system, and there's a secret key to decrypt. So who is the key? YouTube, right? Now, uh, generally speaking, the, ne the network needs to have the key, because the network is computing over the encrypted data. Users can encrypt to the network. The network are computing contracts over encrypted data with a full homomorphic system, but then sometimes you do want to decrypt parts of the data. To give you a very concrete example, imagine you have a DAO where people are casting their encrypted votes to that contract. The, the contract can tell you the, 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 the votes, but at the end of the vote, you need to actually reveal um, who won. You need to reveal how many people voted uh, for each one. So you need decryption at some point, for some reason. Um, and who holds the key? Now, if every validator holds the key separately, then we're back to square one because this is broken. Now, every node in the network just has the decryption key, they decrypt it, no privacy. So, 
the reason I'm saying this is that you actually do need some MPC. And the MPC here is that you basically need to split the, the key, the decryption key, across the nodes in the network, across maybe the validator set. And you can uh, do it in a way that you would need, let's say, two thirds or 50% or 90%. This is, this is the parameter for the trade off. But let's say you need the majority of the network to kind of come together, collude, to actually reconstruct the key and then break the encryption. But this is something that we just can't ignore. Um, and uh, another tidbit is I also think that that's not why keys are probably part of the end game. Today, if you look at like blockchains, a lot of them have like, even us, like there's like Telegram channels with like all the validators, or most of the validators. These people are docs, these people know each other, these people communicate all the time. If you make it very easy for them to collude, then they may come and collude and, and try to break encryption at some point, like this is, this is the risk. So I do think that no matter what, validators will need to hold the, their own keys. They may be smaller keys, they may be more like HSM or like a ledger device, but their shares of the key will probably have to be protected in keys and different kinds of keys, uh, just to raise the bar of, of really uh, uh, making this difficult. The last point I'm gonna make is that now you get to an interesting point where there's like an economic security model behind like the encryption, right? If you need to break two thirds of the network, then you would need to basically, and it's proof of stake network, then you would need to put hundreds of millions of dollars and maybe billions of dollars to actually uh, gain control of the network, plus you would have to break the, the key uh, in addition. So, just wrapping up, I'm betting on the FHE, MPC, and private computing in general. We've been betting on this for 10 years, and I think the next five years is when we be coming from something that we're trying to kind of tell people, hey, this will be something you need to pay attention to, where people come to us and say, how did we miss that before? <coughs> I think now it's a turning point, and hopefully I've been able to convince you this a bit. So thank you very much. I'm actually going to sit, sorry, because I'm also going to do a demo. So I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to manage to do typing on my computer with a microphone, but I'll do my best. So Guy talked about the importance of privacy in blockchain. Uh, he mentioned that FHE was a great solution to that. And so today I'd like to talk about what FHE actually is and how we actually build smart contracts with FHE. So that you know. The idea of homomorphic encryption is that you can basically uh, uh, process data encrypted. So I'm a user of a smart contract. I send data encrypted. The server doing the computation doesn't know anything about my data because it's encrypted. It doesn't have the key to decrypt it either, but it can still do processing on it. Uh, so it basically processes it blindly, sends me back a result, and I can decrypt it with my key. So you can think of homomorphic encryption as end-to-end -end encryption where you can do processing in the middle. Um, the problem with homomorphic encryption is that for a very long time, it was way too slow and impractical to use but today, this is no longer a problem because we have technology where you can compute arbitrary kind of stuff much, much, much faster than we could do before. And that's in big part thanks to Pascal here uh, and the rest of the research team. So in the case of a blockchain, homomorphic encryption is important because it gives you encrypted transaction data, encrypted state updates, encrypted on-chain data. So basically, instead of doing the computation off-chain and sending a proof like you would do in the case of ZK, you could keep everything running on chain with homomorphic encryption. Um, so let's talk about homomorphic encryption. Who actually knows what this is? 
okay, not so bad. So the idea with FHE is that you basically have data and you add some random noise to the data for security reasons. So if you look at the bits in the actual data, the yellow stuff is the thing you're interested in. The red stuff is just some randomness you're adding for security purposes. So that's fine because if you decrypt it, you just cut off the noise and then you have the data that's remaining. The problem is that when you do computation on encrypted data that's noisy, you're not only doing computation on the bits of data, you're also doing computation on the bits of noise. And so eventually, after too many operations, the noise starts to grow and overflows on the bits of actual data, which means that if you decrypt, you will get an incorrect result. So you can think of it like as a approximated result in the end, and if you do more and more computation, the result is just completely random. So again, you know, most people say, that's perfectly fine. Let's just create huge integers with like you know, millions of bits of data, and then we'll just put the noise all the way at the end, and we can compute forever. But that problem is that even doing that, you'll have a limit in how many operations you can do. And in the context of a smart contract, how can you actually do that? Because you don't know how often you're gonna interact with a contract. So if you take something as simple as an ERC-20 token, well, there's an infinite number of times that people might be sending uh, tokens to each other. And so you cannot know in advance how deep the network is, that the circuit is actually gonna be. So eventually, you overflow on the bits of message and your balance will end up being incorrect. So that's a very big problem of homomorphic encryption. How can you create unbounded, unlimited circuits where you can compute forever without having to worry about uh, approximations and errors? So to do that, you need to do something called bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is a special operation in homomorphic encryption where you basically take a noisy ciphertext and you reset the noise to some nominal level. So you do some computation, you stop when the noise is too big, you clean it up, and you can go on forever. And so by doing this bootstrapping operation, you can basically have unlimited circuits. The problem is that every homomorphic encryption scheme up until now could only do addition, multiplication, and bootstrapping. So if you can only do additions and multiplication, how do you actually compare values? Well, you have to basically approximate it. So the way that people do what's called nonlinear functions, like comparisons or any kind of like, I don't know, exponential or min-max function, is they basically use what's called a polynomial approximation. So they turn it into a sequence of additions and multiplication that gives you an approximate result for this nonlinear computation. So again, in the case of something like machine learning, that's perfectly fine because approximations are well correlated by machine learning. But in the case of a smart contract, well, how do you measure those assertions? Either you have the money or you don't have the money, right? What does it mean to have approximately enough tokens to transfer? And so it's a very, very important problem is unless you can guarantee the exactness of the computation, you cannot have homomorphic smart contracts. So thankfully, there is a new scheme called TFHE, which basically enables you to have arbitrary functions that are executed at the same time as you're bootstrapping. And the way that this works is that the bootstrapping operation basically evaluates a homomorphic lookup table. So any function can be encoded as a lookup table, you evaluate that homomorphically, and now you basically no longer have an issue of approximation. So with TFHE, you can have unlimited circuits that actually guarantee the exactness of the result in the end. And so that's why TFHE is such a good technology specifically for blockchain, is because it removes the approximation and it removes the limit in the number of operations. Um, so in terms of performance, uh, there is basically a 10x improvement every couple of years in homomorphic encryption. And where we are today is good enough for blockchain, we believe. And in the next couple of years, thanks to hardware acceleration, it will be fast enough for 80% of application like machine learning or databases. So homomorphic encryption today is a solved problem from a mathematical perspective, from an engineering perspective. The only thing that's missing is this additional performance. And by 2025, it's a done deal. So when people tell you homomorphic encryption doesn't work, well, that's no longer true, actually. It works, and very soon it'll work in pretty much everything you want to do. So let's talk about how you use homomorphic encryption to build a smart contract protocol. But initially I thought I was just gonna explain the protocol, but I figured it might be better to actually do a demo. So before we came here, we were able to put together a homomorphic EVM, uh, where we can basically use traditional Solidity code to do homomorphic smart contracts and execute them on a blockchain. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know that this was gonna work so quickly. Uh, I was expecting this to take us another year to actually build, uh, but let's take a look. So who here knows how to code in Solidity? Great, okay. 
How many people, sorry? Okay, not so many. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so who knows how to code the general? Okay, then you're fine. Solidity is not a big deal, guys, honestly. All right. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me just mirror my screen. I think that's going to be easier. Just give me one second. Okay, I'm not sure how to do it. The new Mac has this weird uh, setting system. Never mind. Let's actually put that here. Okay, great. So, uh, this is a Solidity smart contract that basically plugs into uh, an FHE EVM. So we took the EVM, we added some pre-compiles for the FHE operation, and what that basically means is that you now have this new data type, which is called an FHE integer. So instead of representing your on-chain data as just integers, you can represent them as encrypted integers. So from the perspective of a developer, the logic's exactly the same. The only difference is that you now basically manipulate encrypted data. Um, so here, for example, we've got the balances. Uh, so balances is just like a hash map between an address and an encrypted integer in this case here. Um, so what that means is that if you were looking to look to the on-chain data, you wouldn't see the balance of people. You would see some encrypted number representing that balance. Uh, because you have an encrypted balance, you also have to basically figure out how people can see their own balance. And so for that, you have to do what's called re-encryption. So Guy talked about that. The idea is that you've got an oracle that can do basically re-encryption. You can put whatever kind of logic you want here. This is just some access control logic in the smart contract itself. And then the homomorphic transfer is this function here. It takes an encrypted amount as a transaction input. Uh, it basically does this homomorphic assertion. So this is a require that fails if the user doesn't have enough balance. That, by the way, is 90% of the complexity of the protocol is figuring out how to do that. So how can you check at consensus time that someone has enough token to transfer when the balance and the amount are encrypted? It's pretty tricky, actually. Uh, and then finally, the actual homomorphic addition and subtraction is just these two lines of code. And that's it. So you can see how easy it is for a developer to actually build a smart contract using homomorphic encryption because there is nothing new for them to learn. And I'm just using Remix, by the way. Huh? There is absolutely nothing special. There is absolutely nothing special about the tools. This is just a traditional thing people use in blockchain. And so let's go ahead and compile this contract. That's fine. And then we'll deploy it in the Zama testnet. There you go. Uh, oh yeah, so something else we had to do, oh, that was really tough actually. So we had to integrate with MetaMask, and I'll explain in a second why this is very, very complicated, because MetaMask was really not meant to manipulate you know, homomorphic transactions or produce ZK proofs, uh, but we made it work. So from the user's perspective, it's just gonna look like you know, a normal transaction. Uh, okay, great, I've got my contract deployed. That was really fast, that's amazing. Um, so the issue with MetaMask, however, is that because it doesn't have a concept of encrypted balance, we basically just had to do a, a web app, which is a very simple ERC20 uh, web app to transfer tokens and to see your balance. So here I'll just paste my uh, token contract, there you go. Uh, here you can see that there's currently no supply because we haven't minted any tokens. So I'm gonna go ahead and mint a couple of tokens. What happens behind the scenes is we compute a zero knowledge proof of the value that we want to mint. We encrypt uh, that value and then send it to the network. So again, using just MetaMask as you would usually. We just have to wait a few seconds, not because of the FHE stuff actually, because it's a blockchain. Uh, which by the way, is the reason why blockchain is so good for homomorphic encryption. It's already slow and expensive. So it's a perfect thing for homomorphic encryption right now. So we're just waiting for the block to be mined. There you go, it's done. And so now you can see that the value is encrypted. So if I check my balance, you just see some random number. And to decrypt my balance, what happens here is that I'm basically signing a request to authenticate myself as the person who owns the balance. And that basically goes to the threshold oracle that will basically do a decryption. 
So here's decrypting, and you can see that I've got two tokens. And then now if I want to transfer, I'll just go to Bob's account. So both of them are very rich in Zama tokens. There is no such thing as a Zama token, by the way. Huh? This is just a demo. Uh, I'm going to transfer some tokens to Bob. All right. Sorry, it's a little bit tricky because I can't really see it from where I am. Let's just transfer one token to Bob. So again, computing a ZK proof, and then encrypting, sending it to the network, right? Waiting for the block to be mined. It's only six second block on the, it looks very long during a demo. Okay, so is it still pending? Oh, no, there you go, it's done, okay. Okay, perfect, so the transaction is done, and now if I go to Bob's account, all right, and I decrypt Bob's balance, hopefully that worked, and I have the value one. Yay, there you go, that worked. So this is a real example of an FHE ERC20 transfer. This is not like some you know random stuff I'm doing like in Photoshop or something, like this is a real actual working demo, which I think is actually pretty cool, and if we look at the transaction on chain, uh, let's look on a block explorer here. So this is basically a traditional block explorer, like anything you can actually use on the EVM uh, thing. And now let's take a look at what you actually would see on chain. There you go. So the actual data on chain would just be this blob of randomness. That's it. So if you were looking at the data on chain, you would learn nothing about Bob's and Alice's balance. You would know nothing about the transfer that was just done. You would just see some randomness. Pretty cool, huh? How big is it? A few kilobytes, I guess. Something like that. So yeah, so ciphertexts are bigger, but it doesn't actually matter that much uh, because I think that you know at the end of the day, uh, you're not gonna be doing 100% of your transaction encrypted, right? Uh, and we can also pack a bunch of ciphertexts together. So I think in the end, you know, like it's not gonna be a material problem. And plus, you know, that's probably gonna improve over time anyway. Yep. Can, can you expand on the threshold oracle? Yeah, so I'll get to that in a second. All right, so uh, by the way, this was just an ERC20, but you know, we also had some fun and we actually did a contract for like a blind auction. Is this the one, can you yeah. see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go, okay. So again, this is just Solidity code, right? Super basic Solidity code, just implementing a blind auction concept using homomorphic encryption that's fully on chain. Um, as far as I can tell, you know, nobody has ever been able to demo that, right? Uh, so I don't have a user interface for that yet, unfortunately, but you know, you can deploy it and you can run it and if you wanna do it on chain, uh, you can play with that. Um, great, um, so maybe to explain a little bit of how things work behind the scenes. So what I just showed, you know, looks very simple but it's extremely complicated to actually have uh, work. So the reason is that, first of all, you've got multiple users interacting. And so what that means is that there is one single homomorphic key for the whole network. Otherwise, if stuff is encrypted under a different key, it wouldn't actually be compatible with each other. So the question is, if there is one key for the network, who holds that key and who's able to decrypt everything? The second problem is um, we want the validators to be able to make assertions during the consensus time. But if every validator can request a decryption from the Oracle, what prevents a validator from just asking to decrypt a random value from the actual network and breaking privacy? And finally, what prevents a user from writing a contract that decrypts an input and providing someone else's input to that contract? So how do you prevent users from basically decrypting other users' data? So these are extremely complicated stuff. Uh, so the first part for the secret key, uh, that's easy-ish in the sense that you basically use what's called threshold homomorphic encryption. So you basically have a bunch of nodes, each that have a piece of the secret key, and you have to have a two-third threshold uh, decryption in order to actually get the result. So this is what Guy was mentioning. It turns out that doing threshold decryption and re-encryption for homomorphic encryption is actually very complicated. So the protocol to do that is like 100 pages long of math, basically. Uh, but it works, so that's a very nice thing about it. So that part is fine, so you can think of having an Oracle network that's basically doing this threshold stuff. Uh, for the assertion, things are a little bit more complicated because you basically have to think about it as a two-round consensus mechanism. So you first have the validators to do, doing the FHE computation, 
And once they agree on the value to be decrypted, they send it to the Oracle. So the Oracle waits for at least the majority of the validators to be sending the same request for decryption. And so by doing that, you have a first round of consensus on what should be decrypted. Then the Oracle does its job of decrypting it, sends back the response to the validator, who then finish the consensus and basically put the transaction in the block and finalize it. So it does add a little bit of latency, but there are ways where you can basically optimize that. And again, in any cases in a blockchain, latency is not really the issue. So you know we're just playing around that as well. And finally, to prevent the user from just sending arbitrary data to decrypt, the user has to provide a zero knowledge proof of every encrypted input that is sending to the network. So the idea is that if I'm making an encrypted transaction, I need to provide a ZK proof of the value that's encrypted to prove that I actually know the value I'm sending. And so by doing that, people cannot just copy paste data from the blockchain from someone else and ask to decrypt it. They can only decrypt stuff which they didn't sell. And so by combining those zero knowledge proofs for the inputs with FHE computation in the smart contract and basically MPC threshold decryption, you can effectively build uh, a homomorphic smart contract platform and make the demo that I just showed you before. Um, so what's coming next in the future? Well, so the first thing we want is verifiable FHE. Why? Because right now everybody's doing the FHE computation, which is very expensive. Ideally, what you want is one person doing the computation, everybody else verifying. That's an extremely difficult problem, but it's very important because if you can have verifiable FHE, then you can have FHE ZK rollups. And so that basically would bring the scalability to FHE transactions on uh, their one blockchains, uh, and then finally hardware acceleration to increase the throughput of FHE uh, transactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan, for this demo. We will now uh, start the final part of the session, the panel. I'd like to invite Pascal and Itzik to join us Guy, run, let me set up the chills. We will start off with uh, some introductions from Pascal and Hitzik, uh, and then feel free to raise your hand and we kick it off. So Pascal, please share. Sure. Um, so my name is Pascal. I'm a cryptographer. I've been working pretty much all my cryptographic life, like as a researcher and also working in the industry on homomorphic encryption. So I did my PhD on that subject, like I defended it like in 99. So I'm 50, so it was like a long time ago. And if you can believe it, at the time, the main challenge was to do additive homomorphic encryption, just adding encrypted numbers. And we've come such a long way since then that it's amazing that we're being able to participate, you know, in putting that into production because now we can do Pretty much everything we can compute, we can compute on encrypted data. So it's very exciting to crack the remaining engineering problems and get to that point where we can, you know, deploy that and have like creative developers building stuff on top of that. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm the CEO of Zama. It's a or can I? Your choice. Yeah, I'll just talk. Um, yeah, so I'm Itzik. I'm uh, VP of engineering at Secret Labs. Um, I've been doing cybersecurity and software development for the better part of, I don't know, like 12, 13 years now. I, I'm old, I don't count. Um, I've been in blockchain for about four years, which sometimes feels like I'm an OG and sometimes feels like I'm just a baby, especially around this crowd. Um, yeah, I've been working um, in uh, Secret Labs on Secret Network for about uh, two and a half, three years. Um, so I've basically been uh, working on the project ever since it was, uh, um, back then it was an idea of let's do a layer two privacy for Ethereum. And 
um, then we started transitioning it to a layer one on Cosmos. Um, so I was a part of that whole transition and basically throwing everything out and building it from scratch. Um, yeah, it, it's super exciting. Um, the secret network, as Guy said, you know, everything that's happening on secret network is new. So all our challenges are things that have not been done before. We're not copying, you know, Uniswap and doing it, you know, on another EVM chain, but we're really building new stuff from scratch. And from a technical standpoint, that's a lot of fun. There are a lot of super cool challenges, and it's nice, you know, pushing the envelope a bit farther. <clears throat> Before we take uh, more questions, Brian, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what in general Zama is working? Sure. And maybe just a few words about your personal experience, what got you into privacy? Sure. So, yeah. um, oh, that's now. Just, oh. no. Okay, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've been a developer since I was a kid, started coding when I was like 10. Uh, I built a social network in the 90s. And back then, there wasn't really no concept of data privacy yet. You know, it wasn't really a problem people talked about. And um, since I was a teenager, at some point in school, like this older dude basically started uh, bullying me. And I thought, uh, hmm, what am I gonna do? I'm like half the size of him. Like I obviously cannot fight back physically. So I thought maybe he's using my social network. So I'm gonna go and look at his messages in the database, see if I can find something incriminating. That's not cool, by the way, right? Let's be clear, that's not cool. But I did find something, and I did threaten him to make it public, and so he completely left me alone. And so that got me thinking, is it right that as you know, the provider of a web service, I should have the right to everybody's data? And so from that day, I knew that privacy was gonna be a problem that I was gonna be working on in, in the future. Uh, so fast forward, I went and studied machine learning, did a PhD like 15, 16 years ago in machine learning. Uh, and right after that, uh, started a company doing machine learning with privacy, which got acquired. And that's when I met Pascal, uh, because I was interested in FHE since 2015 and blockchain since 2013. Uh, met with Pascal, and I'm like, hey, can we do machine learning on uh, encrypted data? And of course we couldn't, you know, at the time. Uh, and so a week after I sold my company, Pascal and I started Zama together. So it was a back-to-back -back thing. Um, so yeah, so basically uh, I think, you know, privacy is something that uh, we really need to avoid people like me snooping into your data. Thank you very much. Guy, why is Secret Network interested in FHE? Well, I think I kind of... Kind of talked to at length about that, but I, I, I think that the, the gist of it is um, I do think the, the less unconquered frontier in Web3 is privacy, and I think Secret right now is the best and only first, approximus, first approximation of a solution. But um, uh, I've actually been wrong, so when I did my master's thesis. I went heads down into MPC, general purpose MPC. If people know speeds, Robert circuits, all those kind of things, which are still extremely fascinating and, and I love those and they have a lot of use cases. But the reason is that anyone I talk to, all the cryptographers, my advisor, just looking at like HELib, which was like the only library back then that you could do, it was like so, so bad. And uh, like my assumption back then was that never in our lifetime we will be able to make FHE like something that's useful. And apparently uh, I was so wrong because what is, like, it's only been like, that's like nothing in, in, in engineering. It's been like seven years and uh, as uh, Rand mentioned, uh, the situation completely changed. Um, and the other reason is, and I did touch it a bit, but FHE does uh, translate much more naturally to blockchains than MPC. And this is not trivial because if you think about MPC, the whole idea about MPC is you already have a network. Like by design, you have a network of different nodes. Each one of them gets like a share of the data, random piece of the data, and they kind of do a stuff together to compute the result. So like from a 10,000 feet view, you think that MPC would be much more natural uh, to blockchains than something like FHE. But it turns out that the communication model is so different. The assumptions are so different. The latency is like so high that it doesn't really work, and probably FHE, which is actually just lets it, you can have a network, but you can have every computer kind of do its own thing without like talking to the others, which is actually how blockchains work. 
So it feels like a much, much more natural match. Yeah, and maybe to add to that, uh, everything I'm showing here was inspired by conversation I've started to have with Guy like a year ago, basically. Uh, because when we started thinking about this, it wasn't as clear to us what the use cases were going to be, what kind of design patterns we have to follow. And uh, it's nice because we've been thinking about the same problem from two different angles. And so, you know, it's, it basically converged into something that now is starting to actually work. And, uh, and so it's good that a few of us are starting to think actively about privacy and blockchain and actually really trying to make it happen. Uh, but to be clear, you know, we are not going to launch a blockchain, right? Our job at Zama is to provide FHE technologies to people who want to integrate that into the product, whether it's a blockchain or a machine learning product or something else. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit unpolished with how we both think that work, but curious about hearing about the, the present and the future of um, the components of both systems that are permissioned. So it, it seems that, correct me if I'm wrong, to, to be a fully validated node to run the team is not something that I can just think of. Um, is that, is that like, does that have been an existing set? Um, uh, and, and the same for Zama. Threshold oracles. Can anyone spin up one of those oracles? Like, what, what, what parts of the system are? are yeah. So I'll I'll take the uh, the uh, current state of things and the secret network <laughs> side. And I'll let the Zama guys uh, talk about their vision for HHE. Um, so on secret network, one of the things, one of our core values is openness and decentralization. So all our code is open source. Anyone can run a node. Um, but we don't want to compromise on security, so you can run a node if your no if your hardware is fully compliant. And what that that means is that you have to have you know the latest uh, patches for your system because you know these are you know they have vulnerabilities, so we have to make sure that all the nodes on the network are properly patched and they're all running the latest version of the code. Um, but once you get past those barriers. Anyone can run a node, and anyone can be a validator on the network. So um, there is no permissioning or anything like that on secret currently. Um, so about the Oracle network, uh, technically it's not permissioned. You just have to make sure that you can run the computation. And as Guy said, even though everything is done in cryptography so using secret sharing, for additional security, you want to run the partial secret uh, decryption inside a trusted environment. The reason is not just to improve security by making it even harder to break it, is because of a problem with erasure. So when you have to rotate your Oracle nodes, you have to guarantee that the previous nodes have deleted the share of the key that they have. And so there's no way to do that just in software, right? So we're actually thinking of using the trusted environment as a a way to prove that you've erased the key when you're no longer supposed to be an oracle. Uh, and we rotate the secret shares faster than the time it takes to break uh, with current side channel attacks on T's. Um, and so technically anybody that's running as an SGX node, so pretty much any like, you know, uh, Xeon server, Xeon machine somewhere, could participate in the network. Then, you know, how you incentivize the oracle nodes, that's up to whoever's going to be running the network to decide. Yeah. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Ah, should I? Oh, I thought, I thought you wanted to. No, no. I'm wondering how you monetize that. Seems to be back. Okay. Um, so everything we do is open source and published. So you can use all our stuff for free, but basically for non-commercial use. So the very simple, you know, sort of philosophy for Zama is, it's free if you use it for free. If you make money, we make money. Uh, so it's a very simple licensing model, dual licensing model, basically. Can we be complete on that? Because <clears throat> what we're trying to build is actually tooling. Uh, so applications of fully morphic encryption to the blockchain is one thing, but in general, FHE is very complicated to instrument, to use, to develop, to deploy. So we're actually trying to build like uh, developer tools that anybody can use, where all the complexity of converting like plain text algorithms into their homomorphic equivalent is abstracted away for the developer, and it's extremely difficult, of course, scientifically, 
you know, from an engineering perspective to build such compiler, but this is also the kind of things that we do at Zama. So. Uh, let's say I'm a DAO and I want to uh, deploy a voting contract, um, but I prefer to use, the DAO prefers to use their, their own key, for example, for encryption, and then they as, as a DAO can come to consensus over yeah. decryption. Would that be something that's possible to associate a specific key with yeah. contract? I mean, yeah. te te technically, you so technically you could, and again, that will depend on the design of the network. So again, you know, we don't design the network, right? So we just provide the tools for people to do that. I just made a demo of like an FHE yeah, but you could do that in Cosmosm, you could do that in a custom-made uh, network, whatever you want. In practice, I don't think it's necessary. And the reason is that all of the logic for deciding who can decrypt is in the smart contract itself. So it doesn't actually need like, you know, as a DAO, you wouldn't need your own keys. What you could do is you could have a smart contract that basically defines the rules of who can actually participate. And you could say, oh, decryption only happens once I've accumulated X number of transactions for X number of people. So you could have like a multi-sig in the FHE access control kind of logic in the contract. Um, and that's the nice thing is trying to delegate all of like the choices of privacy to the smart contract developer as opposed to the network protocol. Just to build on that, but this is really programmable. Like even today without FHE, like on secret, like we're working on a threshold DCDSA, threshold, like MPC wallets. And the idea is that, you know, instead of like the contract holding like one key, the full key and being susceptible to that, or the validator splitting the keys and then let's say, in some magical way they all collude, then uh, we are working on a way where you can like split it between like the user or several users, like actually a DAO is a use case. Like there could be a vault of a DAO, you need to out of n of users, they hold like each shares of, of, a, of, a, of a private key, and then the blockchain holds like one or more shares as well. So you can do all of that, all of these are like engineering things that you can decide on. Um, I have one question for this. Just, um, uh, so I was really blown away by the, the concept you introduced with ZK FHE rollups. And when we talk about fractal scaling and higher layers, one of the big problems in research is making data available to the layer one to inherit its security properties. But if you're processing on totally encrypted data, what does the idea of data availability look like uh, on, on the lower layers or like are you at this point even inheriting the security properties of, of layer one uh, going into the fractal? So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure I have like some fully formed thoughts on ZK or FHE rollups yet, simply because it's not possible. Uh, so with Pascal, we've been thinking about how to do that, yeah. but it's probably gonna take us like a few years to crack it. And when I mean crack it, I mean like in a way that is scalable. You know, you could always make it trivially by arithmetizing everything, but you know, if it takes you a ton, a hundred times more time to prove than to redo the computation, there is no point. Um, for the data, I think you have to think of encrypted data as just data, okay. right? So from the perspective of data availability, it's exactly the same pattern, but the only difference is that there is a ciphertext instead of like a plain text. But it doesn't change anything to like the whole architecture. Uh, yes, uh, you'd probably have to think a little bit more about the whole thing in deep, yeah. But by the way, if someone has ideas on like how to combine ZK and FHE, uh, we actually have a, a bounty program for that kind of research projects. Uh, so we're looking to work with the community on that because, you know, even though we have, what, like 35 cryptographers in the company now, uh, that kind of problem is like such an open research problem that it's probably going to come from someone else at some point. Um, so actually, this question is for both uh, Ren and Guy here. Um, I do think that the future is really involved of both uh, secure entries and FHG, mostly because you can't actually handle non-deterministic data with anything except a secure entry. Uh, so really, you were talking about uh, creating uh, FHG keys inside secure entries. Yeah. <laughs> 
when we were talking about making uh, keys for FHC inside the Kiran case, I was, and you talked about the key rotation, uh, I was wondering how often you actually wanted to rotate those keys because you were worried about those side channel attacks, and what types of attacks uh, are you mostly concerned about for secure hunters? Yeah, so about the rotation of keys, we don't actually regenerate the new key. So there is one key generated at inception of the network, so there's like a ceremony to do that. And then you split that key with secret sharing. And so what you do is you rotate the secret shares. Okay. So it's still the same key, so you don't have to re-encrypt the whole network or doing something so complicated. Yeah. It's literally just uh, like... I thought you were saying you were worried about the side channel leaks where those keys could come out. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So them. not the keys, but the shares of the keys. Okay. Right? And so the whole trick is to rotate those shares. Uh -huh. Basically, you invalidate those shares faster than the time it takes to do a side channel attack to retrieve those shares. And what's the recommended time rate for that? I'm not sure. I think you know better. I mean, I think he's still good. So like, if I, like, first of all, you'd probably do it as fast as you can, that it doesn't hurt the system. But like, uh, let's say a very, very safe, maybe even parent of assumption would be maybe order of like a week or weeks, okay. and that's definitely not an issue. Because remember, like, uh, like when both of us said, like those keys, the way they're split, it's like two thirds. So it doesn't help you, even if they're inside of enclave. It, and, and by the way, I do think that there needs to be multiple enclaves because otherwise maybe people can kind of show vulnerabilities if like, there's a zero there. But, but let's say there's multiple enclaves and there's a wide network. Well, like aren't, you aren't, need you, aren't you only as safe as the weakest link? So if you have multiple enclaves, you get... No, because it's a no, two-third no. threshold. Okay. Two th that, that's the okay. point. Okay. So you need to leak from two-thirds okay. at a given time. And if you refresh every week, oh, yeah. okay. then now you need to break two-thirds okay. different variety of enclaves within a week. A, just if you look historically, like big vulnerabilities that are actually not just like like BS. Like there's like CVEs like every couple of months, let's say. Yeah. But big ones, they happen maybe like like a medium one like uh, once every six months, yeah. twice a year, and a big one, let's say once a year. So like if you do it every week, even every month, I don't think that's an issue. Okay. And keep in mind that even breaking the security of the Oracle, that doesn't break the security of the blockchain. So the worst that can happen if you break the Oracle is that you'll be able to break privacy, but you'll not be able to spend all those assets. Right, right. Right. So like that's why it's important to, even though they might be the same validators doing everything, uh -huh. you have to think of the blockchain as like a, a, its own security model and the Oracle as its own security model. Right, right. So I mean, yeah, the breaking of privacy is definitely the bigger risk of what you generally are looking to avoid though. So even if the chain keeps well, yeah, going. That's the point of what we do, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm focused a lot on non-determinism, though, so you, are, you actually can't actually use anything that you're building, unfortunately. But uh, for why, why is non-determinism well, an issue? Well, I mean, you can you can start with like random coins and set up. Let's say you're at the when you're trying to yeah. do you know, traditional work, and all the information they're feeding in is non-deterministic. Yeah. So, yeah. No, but but like one of the things that we do, and we've actually talked to with Zama and with FHE, like that's also very, I mean, should be fairly clear what you do is like doing like on-chain randomness, like you can. Sure. You yeah, can, yeah, I mean, the network can generate and reach consensus on, on, on yeah. coin tossing, right, 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 essentially. Yeah, yeah. okay. The, I'm talking about a different case, but we can discuss it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, on-chain randomness is really cool, by the way. Because, oh, like, yeah, totally. It speeds a lot. Speed for games, for example, yeah. you know, you can have on-chain games completely on-chain so without any external so work. I actually uh, created a VRF for Solana, at least. So. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. What's, what's the point exactly of, of the key share rotation? Uh, you want to talk about that? I guess uh, forward secrecy, like essentially, or, or like adaptive corruptions in an essence, like you assume that, let's say given an infinite amount of time, an attacker would be able to break like one enclave by time, one validator by time. This is like the most paranoid. And if like, let's say key rotation, if you do it like let's say once a week, uh, is very cheap, like no one feels it, then why not? Then then even if there's an attacker that, that steals, like it's very frustrating for like an, an adversary, right? Like every week it will need to start fresh, start corrupting again, start leaking again and, and all that. So it's like, yeah. yeah. There's also an economical incentive. So oracles are potentially like a proof of stake type of uh, network itself. And so imagine you're a node and you have a secret share, right? And you're no longer a node in the next Around the next period of like you know proof of stake selection, then what's your incentive to actually delete the share? At that point, you're no longer getting paid, so you might as well just aggregate all of the keys from the people no longer getting paid, and then you would break security. Yeah. And so that's why you need erasure, 
Uh, and so erasure is something you cannot guarantee unless you have like a trusted environment that basically does the erasure for you and it does an attestation that the erasure was done. And so the key rotation plus the erasure is how you guarantee that people have no economic or capability uh, to break uh, this thing. And you can still assume that like in, in that, like even if you assume that at a given point in time, like some enclaves, let's say, are compromised, but again, the, like let's say every week you rotate and erase, then only the enclaves that are compromised at the end of that week uh, 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 and are therefore might, might misbehave, right? They might not erase and they might not rotate, but the assumption here, and again, I do think this is like an, an unbelievably reasonable assumption, is that uh, not the majority of the network of the enclave were broken in that week, and so even if, let's say, there are like two or three bad apples that were able to break their enclaves, uh, which is again, uh, not, not a frequent thing, then they won't erase their share, and they, and they won't rotate their share, but it's useless. Once everyone else does it, it's completely useless. So, so I can't use my share from last week? No. This week. Yes, no. And it's a common pattern. Every threshold cryptography protocol has the same issue of like, how do you basically, um, yeah, how do you avoid collusion, and how do you guarantee that people cannot reuse a share in the future that's invalid? Uh, so it's not, a, it's not specific to FHE, it's a general yeah. system in uh, threshold stuff. By the way, one thing that really concerns me is that like even putting, like this gets more into threshold cryptography, like on-chain threshold cryptography, and more and more protocols are looking into it. And the uh, irony is that sometimes people are like so fascinated by like just the name of like, you know, this is cryptography, this is cool, this is all that, but then they don't ask those questions, right? I'm like. Interested. Uh, yeah, I mean, threshold cryptography is great, but like one of the reasons we actually moved out from the MPC route and we didn't consider like uh, combining it is, is because uh, uh, like how do you prevent validators or nodes from silently colluding? So you need to leave. To, to yeah, but colluding. it's a silent attack. Yeah. You can't, you can't, like you can't penalize them. That's the difference between like, like if someone breaks consensus and they put stake, you can penalize that. But going off off chain and and, and you know uh, the the weight of the yeah. network would be larger than the stake, so they can collude. There's no incentive mm -hmm. not to collude. Well, you're making it very very hard for them to collude. I think that's the point here. You're making yeah. it like pra practically, in my impossible. opinion, impossible. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you know that's the, that's a risk with cryptography, is that people think that just because the math works, it's secure. But you have to think about the protocol and every single piece and attack vector. And I can tell you that for threshold cryptography. Like it's not trivial to think about how to deal with those, you know, erasure problems and things like that. And you know, people have solutions, but I can many people thinking about it right now don't necessarily think at that level to uh, guarantee security. Uh, and that's why I think you know uh, we get along a lot with uh, with Secret is that they've been working on those protocols longer than we have in practice on the mainnet with billions to steal. Right. So like, if anything, you've been under attack more than any theoretical consideration that we could think of. Uh, which is nice, you know, because we learn, we're like, okay, we have to solve that too. <laughs> so sorry, lastly, just, just to clarify, the, the rotation is baked into the enclave, or the rotation... No, it's baked, no, it's baked into like the network protocol, right? Like oh. it's, it's a code that each enclave runs, like a method, right? Like, like you validate block, so you know that like once every like a thousand blocks, like you've got to rotate, and everyone knows that they, they need to do that, for example. I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they, they have to. They, but if, if you don't rotate, your your share will not actually have an impact. So worst case, if people don't rotate, the Oracle just stops, right? And there's, there's no decryption capability anymore. But at least you don't break security or privacy. It only breaks it in that specific week, 67% of the network. Didn't Look, if, if, if two thirds of the network decides to stop doing their job, the network will halt. Yeah. But that's for every blockchain. So like I think there is an assumption that like people are economically motivated to do what they're supposed to do, uh, and what you want is to make it uh, financially impractical for someone to basically cheat, which is the whole point of a blockchain. A blockchain is a probabilistic uh, security. You know, it's it's not like guaranteed security. There is no math proving that this is secure. It's so economically sure. secure. But we can use cryptography to maximize the security, like the decryption oracle, for instance, provides a proof that the decryption was correct. So, you know, here and there, whenever cryptography can help you, like, uh, 
bringing in uh, guarantees, also security guarantees, it's there. Okay, if there's no further question, I'd just like to ask one last question. Scott and Itzik would like to hear from you. One, two, three years from now, how do you see FHG? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> um, Contributing to different use cases on the blockchain, both from the user side and it's it maybe more from the developer side. And I think there's, I think that we're right now entering a, a golden age, and I think FHC is going to be a big buzzword in the next uh, in the next years to come. Uh, we're trying to figure out exactly. Uh, we think that the what is missing right now, as I said, is like compilation, tooling, like, and performance. So eventually, performance will be there in the next couple of years. This is what uh, we see in, in the space. This is what's happening right now. But this is what is missing for uh, people to widely adopt uh, FHG. There is also the question of uh, uh, outside of the market and outside of the question of performance, there's also the standardization of framework encryption. Because as you know, if it's crypto, it's you know it's sensitive in the first place. But it's also if if there is no standard, people will be hesitant to invest in R and D. And having things being standardized is it means okay the technology is mature enough. And so we're also working and participating within uh, ISO to standardize FHG. So I was uh, like the main editor of the first ever like standard on homomorphic encryption, but it was only about partial, partially homomorphic encryption. So now it's very exciting to contribute to this new standard uh, that contains covers TFHG, which is the technology that we're using, but also the other uh, three ones, uh, the other three schemes like BAV, CPKS, and BGV, because you know other people in this space are using these schemes. Uh, we think they're totally wrong doing that, but you know, uh, there's room for everybody in that space. Uh, but so, <clears throat> I think having a standard for the industry, having scheme specifications that you can give to a developer, and having on top of that great tooling, compilation that takes care of all the, the gory details of the crypto, finding the opt optimal parameters for the algorithm that you're, for which you're building a homomorphic equivalent, these kind of things, is is, is really missing in the space, and that's why there is still this aura around the Fiji it's, it, it's not, it's not ready for, for prime time. But the progress here is like significant, and it goes faster and faster every year. So all the pieces of the puzzle are, are coming together. You, you can think FHG is today where ZK was a couple of years ago. Exactly. That's basically how you got to <laughs> put the two together. And it's funny to see like the similarities between uh, the evolution of the ZK going through compilation and stuff, and virtual machines. Uh, we, we're facing exactly the same questions with FHG, which is pretty intriguing, you know, seeing the, the similarities between the two. Yeah. Uh, and, and probably, as I said before, uh, in the future, having provable FHG is the new Holy Grail, because it means, in theory, you can delegate computation to the other side of the planet. Not only will the data uh, be encrypted, but also it will, the result, the encrypted result, will come back to me with the proof that the computation was actually done correctly. So, because the server over there can just, uh, you know, send you back a random number saying, "Oh, I've done your computation," and there is no means using just FHG to verify that that was correct. And by combining ZK together with FHG. We think it's going to be massive uh, in the history of data processing, and not only in the blockchain, but also like in a, you know the cloud in general. And, uh, it, it, it's going to be major. We, we can already like take uh, uh, you know FHE and, and take an FHE library and implement it in Cairo and run that, but it's stupidly inefficient. So, but we have no doubt that in a, in a couple of years something going to crack that as well. So again, if you have ideas on that. Line. Yeah, we'd love to discuss. Um, um, yeah, so I think for me, like from a developer standpoint, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I saw the demo of the branch, and you know, my socks were blown off. It was amazing, right? It's a nice um, demo, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the fun thing about it is that 
the more you understand about what's going on, the more impressed you are. Because then you realize all the different layers that are working together and everything that's coming together to create a result that for you know somebody that knows nothing, is like, okay, so now you have a one. Okay, obviously, like I go to you know, uh, uh, you know Google and uh, it's encrypted, so you know, great. Um, but if you're in blockchain, and Guy sort of alluded to this also, um, we think you know that to take blockchain to the next level to build those applications that will see the uh, the you know scaling the amount of users by an order of magnitude and bringing it to you know to a level where it provides valuable services, but you know also is accessible to you know your parents or you know somebody that doesn't have to know what you know homomorphic encryption is. Um, so we think that you know bringing this kind of technology with fully homomorphic encryption and doing that, the, the extra steps that sound, sort of, you know, are easy to say on paper, like, okay, so let's take the demo and turn it into a network and deploy it. Um, but that's really, really hard to do. And taking that and scaling it to 10,000 users, then to 100,000 users, then to a million users, uh, each of those steps will have its own set of challenges. Um, but I think, you know, that's where we're heading, and you know that's where uh, the the next the next big you know boom of crypto, the next generation of applications will come from. Thank you. <clears throat> cool. If there's no further questions, I'd like to thank the panel members. I'd like to thank everybody who came in today. Feel free, feel free to hang out, enjoy desserts. Uh, we have some time here left, and have a very productive week. Thank you.